we'll talk about uh, ah Sunder is here. <laughs> we'll talk about nonlinear stochastic equations in the critical dimension. So please, uh, thanks. Alex. Yeah, and thanks for coming. Um, feel free to interrupt and ask questions if you have questions. Um, and I, I don't know if I can see the chat, so if people type in the chat, just uh, interrupt me and, and uh, answer any questions. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So I want to talk about um, so nonlinear stochastic heat equations um, and, and something called the critical dimension. So this is uh, based on joint work with with Yugu, um, and then forthcoming joint work with with Cole Graham. Um, so first, let me introduce stochastic heat equations, and then I'll talk a bit about the role of the dimension in the solution theory, and then I will uh, I'll talk about our results. Um, so what what are what is the stochastic heat equation? So the stochastic heat equation is a nonlinear parabolic uh, partial differential equation, um, and it so it, it is solved by by some uh, u, which is a function of time and space. So time will live in R and X will live in RD. Um, and in general, uh, the solution U could live in some RM. Um, so it could be a vector valued solution here. And the equation it solves is given by DTU is equal to one half times the Laplacian of U. Um, plus sigma of u uh, times c. So what what do I mean by these these parameters? So this is the ordinary Laplacian, um, and this is the, this is the time derivative. So here we have the heat equation. Um, but then to this we're adding some kind of random forcing term. Um, so c is a uh, Gaussian uh, space time white noise. Uh, so what I mean by that is that the expectation of C T X is equal to zero, and the, the expectation of C at T X and C at T prime X prime will sort of ideally be a delta function in the difference in times and a delta function of the difference in spatial coordinates. So this means that the noise is sort of totally decorrelated in both space and time. Um, in the settings that we're going to be consider, considering, we, we can't actually interpret the equation with this space-time white noise, so we'll do sort of the next best thing. Um, so often, uh, we will replace C by something I'll call C epsilon, uh, which is the heat kernel uh, convolved with with C and the heat kernel is taken at scale epsilon, right? So here, GT of X is one over two pi T to the D over two times the exponential of minus X squared over two T. So this is the heat kernel um, and star is spatial convolution. All right, so this is, this, this is now going to be um, smooth in space, uh, but still sort of totally decorrelated what we call white in time. Okay, so, so formally we can write that the expectation of C epsilon at T X and C epsilon at T prime X prime is still a delta function in, in time, um, but now we have a heat kernel at scale epsilon at the difference in spatial positions. Okay. So this is this is the noise that we're going to be adding to our heat equation. And I'll, I'll give some examples and motivation for this in a minute. Um, and uh, ah, sorry. Okay, sorry. I uh, forgot to uh, forgot to write something here. So sorry. Uh, this is really since I'm dealing with RM valued solutions here, um, and and you can really think of M equals one for this talk, but uh, but I actually want this to be a Gaussian um, vector valued space time white noise. So it's just M space time white noises. Okay. And then this would be, I put a transpose here. And then this is times the identity matrix. And this is times the identity matrix. Okay. So, so we, can have, we can have a vector of M space time white noises instead. Okay. So that, that talks about, about C. So we're adding some kind of random noise to our, to our solution. Um, and then what is the sigma? So sigma is some kind of, 
some kind of nonlinearity that's controlling the strength of the noise. So sigma will be a map from Rm into uh, what I'll call S plus of so positive semi-definite matrices. Sorry, I need to uh, wake my computer back up. Um, so, so sigma will be a map from Rm into uh, positive semi-definite matrices, and this will control uh, controls the strength of the noise as a function of the solution. Okay, so let's give some, give some examples of why we might want the, the noise strength to be a function of the solution. So where does this come from? Um, and most of the examples will be for m equals one. So we, when we consider the scalar valued case, but I'll, I'll sort of mention why we might want to consider vector, vector valued um, as well. Uh, so the first example would be uh, if sigma of u is just identically equal to c, um, so here we say that the strength of the noise does not depend um, on the solution. And so this is called the Edwards-Wilkinson equation. Uh, so this is this is just a model of, let's just take the heat equation and just add Gaussian, no Gaussian noise to it. Um, and so the solutions will be Gaussian. Um, so the solutions are Gaussian. You can explicitly write down the correlation function in terms of the heat kernel. Um, so this is also very explicit um, and, uh, you know, mathematically, uh, you know, pretty, I mean, completely, completely understood. It's just a Gaussian process, um, although, uh, so the, um, but one way to think about it is that the uh, stationary measure is the Gaussian free field. So this is kind of a dynamical version of the Gaussian free field. So that's a, that's sort of the, the first simplest case, the Gaussian case. Um, another case that, that is um, very popular to look at is if sigma of u is equal to beta times u. Uh, so this is called the multiplicative uh, stochastic heat equation, um, also called the uh, parabolic Anderson model. And uh, so this this is a um, this models the the free energy of a directed polymer. Uh, so actually, um, with this choice of nonlinearity, we can actually write a Feynman Katz formula for the solution to this to this equation. Um, and so actually, u at, of t and x uh, will be the expectation with respect to an auxiliary Brownian motion studied at time t and position x of the exponential of beta times the integral from zero to t of um, c of s xs uh, minus uh, um, c times t uh, for some constant c. So this is the this is the Ito correction. Um, and then I guess if we have an, an initial condition, then this will be multiplied by u of zero and x of zero. Um, so, so this is basically saying, uh, we this is sort of a, a model for, um, and so okay, this is a Brownian motion with x of t is equal to x. Um, so this is basically saying we wanna do some kind of model for a, um, for a random walk in a random environment. So we think of the, the sort of original random walk as a Brownian motion. Um, but then we want to tilt the measure of the of the random walk or of the Brownian motion um, by the by the um, by the noise field. So we want to sort of favor. We want the random walk to sort of favor locations where, it, where it's feeling sort of greater values of the noise. So the noise can represent some sort of um, environment. So more, larger value of the noise means a more favorable environment. Um, and so we integrate. Uh, so this is this is ds. Um, so we integrate the the noise along the Brownian path. And uh, and then then we exponentiate that and we multiply by this inverse temperature parameter beta, um, and then this u is actually gives us the partition function um, of the solution here. Uh, so this this is um, 
not totally totally vigorous with really the space time white noise but if we if we replace the space time white noise by this mollified space time white noise then this this makes perfect sense if we if we really have space time white noise here um then the c is a is um is actually infinity um so you can think of this as sort of a wick ordering of this exponential but but i won't i won't get into those those kinds of details um but but the point is that this uh, stochastic heat equation is is modeling the partition function of this polymer model so that's sort of a, a motivation for studying this thing Okay, um, so this this is also um, this is the one that's related to um, the KPZ equation and the stochastic Burgers equation uh, by by the Kohlhoff transform. So if you know about these things, this is this is the model that uh, that's related to those. Okay, um, so let me just do a couple more couple more quick examples. Um, so we can also take uh, sigma of u to be the square root of u, um, and this this gives an equation that's um, that's solved by something called super Brownian motion. Uh, so this is a limit of um, branching Brownian motion. So the idea here is that we have sort of many, many, um, many particles. We can think of them as some kind of organisms, and each each organism undergoes a Brownian motion totally independently of each other. Um, but then at at random times, um, a particle uh, will decide to to do one of two things. So each particle has an independent exponential clock, and when the clock rings, the particle will either split into two particles, and then each particle then then just undergoes another Brownian motion and, and the same dynamics, um, or the particle can also die. So maybe maybe this particle splits first, and then this particle's clock rings again, and then the particle dies. And then when the particle dies, it's it's gone and it doesn't it doesn't participate anymore. Um, so this is this is branching Brownian motion. Um, and if you take if you take a scaling limit of this process, so you you take a large number of particles and you say the particles should branch at a very high rate, um, then in fact. Uh, you the um, the density of particles will converge to a to a solution of the stochastic heat equation uh, with sigma of u is equal to square root of u, um, and so so where does the square root come from? Um, so the so the the the, the Laplacian in the heat equation kind of comes from the diffusion of the particles, um, but the variance um, of the change in particle density is proportional to the particle density. And so sigma is giving us sort of the standard deviation, so that's why it's the square root, right? So the variance of the change in particle density is proportional to the particle density uh, because each particle has an independent chance of, of branching or dying, right? and those, those are sort of changing the particle density by one. So the standard deviation of the total change in the particle density is, is like square root of u. Um, so this is where that comes from. Um, and uh, so one, one last example, we could take sigma u to be equal to the square root of u times one minus u. And this in certain regimes gives limits of the Vodou model. Um, so the Vodou, Vodou model is saying we, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a referendum and we have many voters. And each voter is either pro or con on, on the issue, uh, on the referendum. So we'll write plus for pro and, and minus for con. And the voters live on a street grid. So they, they live on a, on a lattice. So I'll draw it in, in two dimensions. Um, so, so maybe these are kind of the opinions of the voters. And each voter has an exponential clock. And when the clock rings, the voter chooses one of her neighbors and, and talks to her. And uh, and convinces her neighbor to to adopt her position. So maybe this voter talks to this voter, and then then this then this this plus sort of spreads to the minus, right? And then the minus becomes plus. So this voter convinced this voter, um, but then maybe this maybe this minus voter then talks to the plus voter, and then the plus voter becomes becomes minus, right? So the voters are sort of very convincing. So they when they talk to each other, they always convince each other to adopt their positions. 
Um, and then, you know, maybe this plus voter talks to the minus voter and the minus becomes plus. Um, but then maybe this minus voter talks to that same plus voter and then the plus becomes minus again. Okay, so this is a, this is a voter model. Um, and again, under appropriate scaling limits, um, we expect this to be modeled by the, the SPDE, by the stochastic heat equation with this noise strength. Um, and the point here is that the, the, um, the variance of the change is now proportional to sort of the, the number of disagreements locally that are happening, which is like U times one minus U. If U is the density of the number of pro-voters, um, then one minus U is, is the density of con-voters, and then you, you have a change, you, know, you, you see a change in opinion when you have a disagreement, you're pro and a con. So the number of possible disagreements is, is like U times one minus U, and then we take the square root to get the standard deviation. Okay, so these are sort of four examples of why we might want to pick sort of different nonlinearities here. Um, for m being, so this was all sort of in, in the scalar case, um, for, for m greater than one, um, I won't go into too much detail on this, but, but we can consider um, uh, what we call mutually catalytic processes. So we can have mutually catalytic um, branching processes. And so here the idea is that we have, um, so it's it's like this branching Brownian motion model, but we have two species um, and the, the reproduction and death rates of each species depend on the populations of both species. The, protocol, the prototypical example is we have maybe rabbits and, and foxes, um, and so then the rabbits sort of reproduce at a rate that depends on the, on the, on the uh, oh, sorry. Um, no, no, sorry, this is not the, the rabbit and fox model. Um, that would be a drift. So here we just said that we have we have sort of two types of, of um, maybe bacteria or something, and, and one one sort of you know the presence of one 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 type of, of bacterium is sort of a catalyst um, for the other one, and maybe sort of speeds up the the um, the, the branching and death rate um, of the of the other one. So, so that's why we have the uh, that's why we have this um, this interaction between the two. So in that case, we would then think of a, a multi-dimensional model, and then depending on how we set up the the mutual catalysis. Uh, we would still have the square root, but then inside would be some kind of linear functional of the, of the two uh, of the two models. Okay, so um, so this is where this is coming from. Um, so that's that's some examples. Uh, let me now um, talk a bit about phenomenology. So let's so I've sort of given some motivation for for setting these equations, um, but let me now talk a little bit about um, about how we can solve them. And it turns out that really doing these with space time white noise is is sort of not so easy for most of these cases or impossible. Um, so let me focus on the multiplicative stochastic heat equation, which is sort of the, the model for, the, for, for what I'll talk about here. A sort of prototypical, prototypical example. So for the multiplicative stochastic heat equation um, phenomenology. So I guess I can rewrite the equation. So DTU is one half times Laplace U plus beta times U times C. Um, in dimension one, uh, this equation can be solved. So it's not totally not totally obvious how you would solve this equation because the space-time white noise is very rough. So it's totally decorrelated in both space and time, which means it's a very rough object. Um, Nonetheless, in dimension one, this equation can be solved uh, using um, Ito-Walsh integration. Um, and this is what was called, um, what we call mild solutions. Um, or in PDE, this is sort of called the, the Duhamel principle. Uh, so, so we can set up a fixed point argument and solve this, and this goes back to back to the 80s. Um, so this is sort of very classical. Um, so, so we can really sort of make sense of this, of this equation in, in dimension one. Um, however, um, in dimension two, um, or dimension greater than or equal to two, 
uh, there is no solution theory uh, with space time white noise. So formally, uh, the variance um, blows up. So if you try to do a fixed point argument, you won't be able to control the variance. Um, so in dimension two, we need kind of a, um, so we, you know, we're, we're still interested in direct and polymers in dimension two. So it's still, you know, we're still sort of motivated to solve this equation in dimension two. Um, but, but this, um, space time white noise is, is, is sort of not going to be something we're going to be able to solve it with. Um, so how can we, how can we kind of get interesting limits of, of things that we believe that should limit to these equations in, in dimensions, at least two. Um, so what can we do in dimension greater than or equal to two? Um, so the idea is to mollify and also attenuate the noise. So we will let dt u epsilon be equal to one half times the Laplacian of u epsilon um, plus beta hat sub epsilon of times u epsilon times c epsilon. And here, so we say this c epsilon is this mollified noise. This is the noise mollified at scale epsilon. And um, where beta hat epsilon is equal to beta times, and then it'll be times log epsilon to the minus one half in dimension two, or epsilon to the d over two minus one in dimension greater than or equal to three. And this is chosen such that the variance of the solution is order one as epsilon is taken down to zero. So in dimension one, you, you don't have to put anything here. The variance will be order one as, as epsilon goes down to zero. But in dimension two, if you want the variance to be order one as, as, the, as the noise becomes, becomes um, totally decorrelated, uh, then you should, you should divide the, the noise by the square root of log epsilon. And in dimension at least three, um, you should you should multiply the noise by this. This is a small factor, right? When dimension is at least three, this this exponent is, is positive and epsilon is small. Um, so so uh, so you'll make the noise sort of very weak in, in dimensions at least three. Um, but but these are the these are the right choices to get an order one um, variance of the solution as, as epsilon goes to zero. Um, and so for the rest of this talk, um, we will talk about dimension two. So this is what we call the critical dimension. Um, and sort of the, the reason we call it the critical dimension is that there is a scale invariance. So if we rescale the equation, um, formally we get the same thing. Um, and so that's why we have the uh, log factor. So we have to put this logarithm. Um, so if every scale is contributing equally, so we have to sort of uh, divide by by the log of, of of epsilon, which is sort of the number of scales, and so that that will give us an order one an order one variance. Okay, um, but but so this this sort of discussion was about the um, was about the um, the linear or the multiplicative of stochastic heat equation, and I um, and I, I promised the nonlinear stochastic heat equation. Um, oh goodness, I am. Uh, Doing something interesting with my tablet here. Let's see if I can just turn the page. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, okay. Um, 
So, uh, so in the nonlinear stochastic heat equation, we can try to do a similar thing. So, um, in general, uh, we can consider uh, dt u epsilon is one half times the Laplacian of u epsilon uh, plus sigma of u epsilon times c epsilon, but then let's still divide uh, by log epsilon inverse, right? Um, and here, this will be u epsilon is u epsilon of t and x, t and r, and x in r2. Okay, so here we're in the critical dimension, but but now we uh, we put in this this arbitrary nonlinearity. Um, and let me now talk about two examples um, where this has been studied. Um, so the first example will be when sigma of u is equal to beta times u. So so back to the back to the parabolic Anderson model. Um, and the other case will be when sigma of u is equal to square root of u. Um, and this is, so I, I'm actually lying a little bit here. So what I'm actually going to talk about is super Brownian motion, which is where we, um, where we don't mollify the noise, but we, we, we don't mollify the noise. Um, it's, so the results here are for super Brownian motion, but, but um, Morally, it's the same as for super Brownian motion, we mollify the solution. So instead of mollifying the, the noise, you mollify the solution. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of, uh, you can ask, ask questions about that at, at the end if you're interested. Um, but I, I just want to kind of heuristically present uh, two, two theorems here. Um, so these are, these are both, um, well, probably not classical at this point, but both several years old. Um, so this, this, um, this parabolic Anderson model, uh, this was studied by uh, Francesco Caravenna, um, Long Feng Sun, and Nikos Zigouris uh, in 2017. And uh, what they proved, um, uh, okay, and so for both of these results, uh, let me, so I, I haven't ever talked about the initial condition, so I should impose an initial condition. So let's say that just for simplicity, this can be can be generalized. Um, but let's just say we have initial condition, which is constant and it's equal to some to some a. Okay, so we just have constant initial condition equal to some some value some value a. Um, so what Kervin S. and Ziegler has proved uh, was that for fixed positive time, fixed x in R two. So we're looking at sort of one point at a time, and then beta. So there's a phase transition in beta. So if beta is less than square root of two pi is the critical value. Um, we have uh, u epsilon at t and x is converging in law as epsilon goes to zero uh, to an explicit log normal random variable. So it'll be a times the exponential of z beta minus one half times the variance of z beta. And here z beta is a normal random variable with mean zero and variance one over one minus beta squared over two pi. Okay, so so this is an explicit, explicit variance here. Um, and note that the variance blows up as beta approaches square root of two pi. So something different happens at, at, the, at the critical beta, um, which is also very interesting, but, but sort of beyond the scope of this, of this talk. Um, so this is kind of pretty remarkable that, that um, we have this explicit, so if you look at just one fixed space time point, um, they're actually showing that there's this, there's this explicit distribution um, of, of, the, uh, of the solution um, evaluated at that fixed space time point as epsilon is taken to zero. So that's that's sort of not something you see very often in in, uh, in stochastic PDE. Um, okay, so that's 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 one result. Um, so this result of sigma of u is being equal to square root of u. Uh, this result is due to Clenkey, um, twenty years before in 1997, 
uh, but kind of in a kind of in a different different community. Um, but nonetheless, the result is completely analogous. So for fixed uh, positive time uh, x in R two, we have u epsilon of t x is converging in law as epsilon goes to zero to, so it's not, not a log normal random variable anymore, it's something else, it's something we'll call x of two. Um, where x is the solution to a stochastic differential equation. So x solves dx of q is equal to square root of x of q times dbq for some Brownian motion b, and x of zero is equal to a. Okay, um, so here we don't have a log nullary random variable. We have a, a square root diffusion or a Feller diffusion, um, but but nonetheless, there's there's still an explicit um, distribution of of, um, uh, of a random variable that this uh, that the solution at, at to our stochastic PDE at some fixed space time point is converging to. Okay. Um, let me mention just one, two words each for the proof methods here. So just to emphasize that the proof methods are totally different. Uh, so the proof here is by chaos expansion. Um, kind of via the uh, directed polymers. Um, so so because of the um, because of the directed polymers here, you can sort of this the directed polymer gave us some kind of exponential of something, um, where you have a formula in terms of the exponential of something, you can expand that exponential in a, in a Taylor series, um, and then sort of study each, each term in the Taylor series separately, and, and that's how they proved this result. Um, uh, the proof that Clanky used uh, was totally different. Um, this was based on a duality theory um, for super Brownian motion. Okay, so for super Brownian motion, uh, for super Brownian motion, uh, there's a duality theory um, for the and so uh, for the for the Laplace transform, um, and so he was then explicitly um, computing uh, limiting Laplace transform. Okay. Um, so similar results, totally different proof strategies. Um, and so let me just mention one more thing. So in both cases, um, so this is just for one point statistics uh, to see interesting multi-point statistics. Um, one should consider u epsilon of tx and u epsilon of t prime x prime, where t minus t prime plus x minus x prime squared is equal to, is on the order of epsilon to the two alpha for some alpha in between zero and one. So if you wanna see, so if you look at two points that are macroscopically separated, uh, the solutions will become sort of independent of those two points. Um, but if you want to see interesting uh, correlations, um, you should look at points that are separated by by some um, algebraic uh, distance at an epsilon. So you look at two points that are sort of very close together, then then they'll, you'll see kind of non-trivial loading correlations for, for these two points. Right. So this was both pro both proved um, in in these results. Um, uh, Alex, uh, yes. may I ask a, a question? Of course. Uh, yes. So. Uh, in the in the super Brownian motion, if if you put a beta in in front of the square root of u or or inside yeah. the square root, yes. uh, do, do do you get the, the same uh, the the same thing but with x at a different time that depends on beta or? Um, yes. Okay. So that is a that's a good question. Um, it's the answer is simple, but I forgot exactly what it is. Um, I think. If you put a beta in front of the square root, I think you just get a beta in front of the square root here. Um, in fact, yes, I believe that is correct. 
Um, so and there's no there's no phase transition. Okay, so for yeah, for this equation, you don't have a, a blow up, right? Um, no, there's no there's no blow up in, in beta. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and is, is this this normal z beta? Is this what you would get if you get the same equation but without square root or? Um, so not quite. Um, so it you will if you put if you don't have the square root here, uh, you will get a log null of random variable, um, but it won't have the right dependence on beta. So it's actually it'll actually be a time change of that equation. Um, but but at a certain yeah, so it, it will be that it will be sort of this equation, but it'll be at, at sort of a different time. Um, yeah, it turns out that that's a bit of a coincidence, but uh, but I'll, but yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, can I ask you a simpler question? Can you yes. comment on uh, why it doesn't depend on T and if you expect uh, some scaling in which that will depend on the, the T? Yes, okay, so so right. So um, the, the fact that this does not depend on T is basically coming from the fact that, um, that with this scaling, the contributions to the solution, or the contributions of the noise to the solution are only depending on sort of a thin layer, um, a thin layer of the noise before T. Right, so um, so actually, all all t of order one are looking the same. If you want to see sort of a dependence on t, you would have to take t to be sort of epsilon to some power. Right, so you could take t to be a epsilon to a positive or negative power, and then you get a you get a dependence on what power it is. Right, so everything's sort of happening on this sort of um, uh, ultrametric scale. So as epsilon goes to zero, you get sort of this ultrametric structure. Um, if if you look at field level statistics, so you, if you subtract the mean and then you sort of look at distribution valued solutions, um, or you sort of subtract the mean and then you sort of you blow up the solution and you look at distribution valued solutions, um, then you get convergence to Edwards Wilkinson. Um, so that's that turned out to be sort of an orthogonal story to the one I'm telling today. Um, but in that case, then you do see a, a sort of the dependence on a diffusive dependence on time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the questions. Um, Okay, um, so so the, the question that that uh, that I want to answer here is: uh, Can we generalize uh, to other sigma? Um, and so the question is is yes, um, but in order to uh, in order to generalize to other sigma, um, I need to um, I need to come up with something that uh, will generalize. Is this this log null random variable and also generalize this um, this filler diffusion? Uh, so these are these are um, and so as as was pointed out, these both solve an SDE, but it's actually a little bit more complicated. What we need to do to get an SDE that will work for sort of a general sigma, okay? Um, so the limiting object for General sigma will solve a what we call a forward, what everybody calls a forward backward stochastic differential equation. Um, namely, so let me write the equation and then we'll spend a little time sort of interpreting it. Uh, so D, so we have two parameters here, two kind of uh, Parameters and then it's sort of a time parameter, so we'll, it'll depend on a and capital Q. So dx d of x sub a capital Q at, at time little at time little Q uh, is equal to j sigma of capital Q minus Q. So capital Q we're going to think of as sort of the final time, and a is the initial condition. Um, so it'll depend on this function j sigma, which I'll introduce in a little bit of Q capital Q minus Q, um, and then evaluated at the solution at this time. Uh, dbq, um, little, so a is the initial condition, and then what is this j sigma? So j sigma evaluated at little q and b is equal to 1 over square root of 4 pi times the expectation of sigma squared of x b little q at q, and then we take the square root. Okay, actually, I don't want this line here. So, so this is this is kind of a funny thing. Um, so the the diffusivity. So this is a this is a martingale. Right, the solution to this will be a martingale. It has an SDE with no drift term. Um, 
but uh, but this is the diffusivity is is given by this function j sigma of the solution at the current time, and this diffusivity um, sort of in turn depends on the statistics of the solution to the STE. So it's a little bit circular because in order to know the statistics of the solution, you have to know the diffusivity, and in order to know the diffusivity, you have to know the statistics of the solution. Um, I think it's a little bit clearer to write it in a in a slightly different way. Uh, so it turns out that this thing um, is, you can check that this is equal to one over square root of four pi um, times the expectation of sigma squared of X a capital Q of capital Q. So this is the same, the same solution, um, but now evaluated at the final time. Uh, but this is a conditional expectation, conditional on X a capital Q at the current time. And then we take the square root. And then this is all dBq. So what we're saying is that the this is an SDE. The diffusivity at the time lowercase q is the expectation of sigma squared of the solution at the final time conditional on the current value of the solution. So this is still circular because you know, sort of the, what you expect the solution to be at the end is certainly dependent on what the, what the diffusivity is going to be now. Um, so, so it's still a little bit um, circular, but there's, you can actually make sense of this equation via a, a fixed point argument. Um, so, so this is uh, this is sort of um, the object that that will come up. Um, another characterization which is useful uh, is that if we define h sub sigma to be j sub sigma squared, this solves a PDE. Um, and okay, so so at this point, let me emphasize that so here sigma can be matrix valued. So here here this works in for general M. Uh, so, so sigma can be matrix valued. Um, and then this square root is the is the matrix square root. Um, the unique positive semi-definite matrix square root. Um, so this the square of, of this diffusivity actually solves a, a PDE. Um, and what what PDE is it? So uh, dQ of H sigma is equal to uh, one half times H sub sigma, and then we trace this against the Hessian of H sigma. Um, so this is the Hessian in B, and then the initial condition is given by H sigma of zero. B is one over four pi times sigma squared of B. So another way of, of thinking about the solution here is that you can solve you can solve this um, this PDE, uh, take the square root to get j sigma, and then you just have a, an ordinary uh, stochastic differential equation um, with this j sigma in here. Right? So that's another way to to think about this. Okay. Um, cool. May I uh, ask a very silly question? Yes. So, there's any reason why you're calling the time Q? Uh, yes, because it is not the same as the so it is not the same as the um, as the original time scale. Um, so in our heads, um, we should think that uh, so T is equal to or we call it S is equal to T minus epsilon to the Q. So, uh, so this is kind of the, uh, this is sort of the natural scale of the evolution, but so I give it a different letter. So it's, uh, so it's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, if I have time, I'll, I'll, it looks like I will not have time, but I will uh, try to try to say a little bit about, about this, but yes. Um, good. Okay. So um, I, just to, to uh, make sure, this PDE you have is, is, is supposed to be the, the analog of this uh, square root of u, the, the, the one that you had on the previous slide for the branching super super the, for the yes, super so, um, yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, so let me let me state the result and it'll it'll play the exact okay. same role as that okay. as that diffusion did and that the, that the geometric granny motion did. Yeah. Um, right. So so let me um, I can uh, okay. So in order to state the main result, I need to introduce sort of one more one more quantity. Um, so this is Q bar of sigma is the maximal uh, Q 
um, such that uh, J sigma uh, with the first argument frozen at Q is uh, uniformly Lipschitz. Okay, uh, so this is this is uh, Q sigma, and then the theorem. Uh, so this is um, joint work with with Yugu, and then I'm kind of combining a sort of a generalization, uh, which is with Cole Graham. Is that so? Suppose that Q bar of sigma is strictly greater than two. Uh, then for, so it's the exact same thing. So for any fixed T greater than zero and X in R2, um, we have U epsilon of TX is converging in law as epsilon goes to zero uh, to X sub A two of two. So it's we we take the final time to be to be two um and uh and then we evaluate and we evaluate the, the four backward SDE at this final time. Um and uh and then this is giving us the, the limiting distribution here. Okay. Um so uh My my hypothesis. So remember, there was a phase in the linear case when when sigma of u was beta times u. We had a phase transition, and here I'm not explicitly mentioning mentioning any phase transition. Um, and so we know, but we know that this kind of result sort of cannot always be true because of the linear case. It's not it's not always true. Um, so we need to sort of better understand this condition that q bar of sigma is, is greater than two. All right. So that's um, that's that's sort of uh, the uh, natural question. Um, so when is Q bar of Sigma greater than two? So we have, we, we, uh, we don't yet have a complete result to this, to this, um, to this question. And in fact, in higher dimensions, we, we don't know uh, too much yet, but it's kind of work in progress. Um, so the one thing uh, we do know, um, which is sort of a, a quite, quite general result, but not, not the best result that, that we can expect. Um, so for any M, uh, we have q bar of sigma is greater than or equal to four pi divided by the Lipschitz constant of sigma squared. Okay, uh, so if the Lipschitz constant of sigma is strictly less than square root of two pi, so this is the same square root of two pi that showed up in the linear case, uh, then q bar of sigma is greater than two. So this exactly matches the this exactly matches the linear case. Um, actually, we can go further. Um, so in M equals one, we're not further, but this is sort of not, not strictly better or worse than the previous result, but it's different. Um, so if there is a C um, such that uh, zero is less than C inverse is less than sigma of U is less than C is less than infinity, for all u, um, then parabolic regularity implies that uh, q bar of sigma is actually equal to infinity. So if, if sigma is bounded above and, and away from zero, um, then then our theorem sort of sort of holds holds quite generally. Um, if sigma has zeros, um, and say sigma of zero is equal to zero. Um, so, say has, say, so you can see it's sort of a more complicated condition, which I won't, which I won't really go into here. Um, but suppose that, that sigma of zero is zero, um, and sigma of u is uh, less than or equal to beta times u um, for some uh, beta strictly less than square root of two pi um, plus uh, some what I'll call qualitative conditions. Uh, then the q bar of sigma is, is also greater than two. So if if, if sigma is, is sort of less than the linear case, 
Um, so this is saying that sort of the the um, important thing is sort of behavior sort of at infinity and and at zero. Um, but if it's if it's less than beta times u for some beta that's strictly less than square root of two pi, um, plus some sort of conditions that we need sort of qualitatively, but we don't need sort of precise uh, precise some um, uh, you know, things having to do with the phase transition, um, then then the result is also satisfied. Um, and so for for higher dimensions, this is sort of this is sort of work in progress. Um, Okay, um, so so now let me let me um, just finish by tying this back to the examples that we knew about. Um, so so um, if sigma of u is equal uh, to beta times u, um, then we get a new proof of the result of Caravanasan and Zegras. So we exactly recover. Um, their their results. So in this case, the um, the the uh, the um, Floyd Beckwith SDE can be solved explicitly, and the solutions are log normal. And so we explicitly we actually recover the the log normal result that Caravan and Simon Segura has proved. Um, if sigma of u is equal to square root of u, um, the so we are consistent. Uh, with Clanky uh, formally, uh, but our theorem does not apply. So this Lipschitz condition is not satisfied if sigma of u is square root of u. Um, but nonetheless, the uh, the um, the solution to the, for the solution to the Ford backward SE is given by this square root diffusion. Um, and so actually we, we are consistent with the results of clanky, but but uh, we have these regularity issues that, that keep our proof from actually working in this case. Um, so, okay, uh, so I, I have a question. So so your condition, I mentioned that your condition guarantees that the solution of your 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 SPD uh, well of your of your yes of your stochastic differential equation does not blow up. Yes, but but it's not necessary. You can. It's possible that the solution is well defined up to uh, and 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 that the solution the, the condition is not satisfied. Right. So it's possible. Yeah. So it's, so it's right. So the solution you can you can make sense of the solution um, even if the diffusivity is not much. Yes. Okay. So do you do you believe that uh, your theorem is true as soon as the, the solution does not blow up? Until time two, or yes. So I think because because it's because we have this consistency result. Um, and in that case, you know, in the square root case, since, since our theorem, you know, if it did apply, it would say the right thing. Um, that seems to be strong evidence that it should apply for sort of more general non limited sigma. Um, and we're working on sort of how to prove this. Okay. But, but it's, uh, it's, we've far from being well understood yet. But, okay. but yeah. Um, I think, I think, uh, I think that's a good place to stop. Yeah. So I'd be happy to take any more questions people have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alex, for this very clear uh, talk. Is there any other question, final question, maybe, in the room or in the in the Zoom? Let me see. Okay, so I I have a, a question. It, it's going a bit in some another direction, but uh, so uh, if you have okay, so I I believe that in in this theorem. Uh, if you take two different x's, uh, then you get independent variables, right, in the scaling limit. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so, so in particular, it, it, it means that the, the solution, if you look at it uh, as a distribution in x, then it converges to a, to a constant. Yes. So, in the in the Caravena uh, sun Zigua's case, uh, this uh, beta uh, equal one over square root of two one over square root of two pi. It yes. was. It's really the 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 point at which, okay, the variance of the total mass of the solution. Say if you if you start with a uh, blow up, uh, in the in in a, in a, in, a, in the case like the super Brownian motion, uh, it probably it mean it means that you should take beta equal infinity to have that. So 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 maybe a scale a bit which is a bit beyond the square root of. Of uh, log epsilon. Do, do you know which scale you have to look at to to see this, uh, like the variance of the total mass of the solution starting to have 
non-trivial behavior and if some people yeah so actually for super burning motion it's it's been understood for for a very long time okay um and i think actually from the perspective of the super burning motion community uh what what clanky was doing here was a little bit funny um so actually what the what when when you traditionally consider super burning motion you don't divide by the square root log epsilon here right you you just so in so you can actually think of beta is like square root of log epsilon and then you get a measured value solution so then, and that's that's actually what super burning motion is—is is that solution with without the square root of log epsilon. Um, so so here, you know, so Clunky was also saying, okay, let's take super burning motion, but let's do a very slow branching, and then we'll mollify it a little bit, and then we get function value limits. But there's also this sort of measure value process um, that's sort of also there. So it's two different ways of of scaling, and you get different different things. Yeah. But yeah, so beta equals infinity, and in particular, okay. we're going up at this sort of log scale. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other question? I have a question. Yes, yeah, so um, if I if I'm not mistaken in the in in, in, in the world of the super running motion, getting out of the square root of u regime, I mean or, or, or putting something like it looks like square root of u at uh, at zero. It's extremely difficult. I mean, it's uh, I mean, there are yeah. like uh, so. So, do you do do you do you, do you see some of these uh, difficulties on your work as well? Well, so that's where this condition on the key bar of sigma is coming from. So, so, so actually, our actual results that we have are assuming that sigma is Lipschitz, and then you uh, then you avoid these these problems. So, so that, that is why. So, I, I believe that this theorem is true in the non Lipschitz case, but because of the exact technical issues that you are referring to um yes it's uh it's difficult to uh to study this so okay so, um, hopefully in a few years so I'll be able to come <laughs> back and tell you something great <laughs> yeah all right thank you okay let's check again if somebody else wants to ask last question to to alex No, it does not seem so. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Alex. Thanks for the invitation. And, uh... Hopefully see you soon. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.